is a moment of magic when you transform the ordinary to something really special. That's what happens the first time you make your own kombucha. Not everything is worth making at home. You can make your own beer, for example, and it'll likely be slightly worse and slightly more expensive than what you could buy in the store. Kombucha is the total opposite. You can make some for a fraction of what it costs to buy. Making it at home can be intimidating, however. Bad kombucha is terrible. It can be too sweet, it can be vinegary, and worst of all, it could be moldy. When I found out I'd be working on a healthy drinks book, I thought what better opportunity to demystify the magic of kombucha for the home cook. The challenge for me was to find all the things that could go wrong and why. Four months and 40 batches later, I found some answers. We're gonna get super nerdy about kombucha today. We're gonna delve into the science behind it and you'll see all the mistakes I made during testing. <laughs> so you can make your own fizzy, inexpensive, delicious kombucha at home. What even is kombucha? It's fermented tea. Taking a step back, what's fermentation? In cooking, it's the controlled transformation of a food or drink using microorganisms, and it usually involves some form of sugar to feed that fermentation process. If you take grape juice, add yeast, let it ferment, you'll have wine. It won't be very good wine, but it'll be wine. Here, the microorganisms are baker's yeast, and the sugars are fructose that are found naturally in grape juice. If you take milk, add lactic acid bacteria, and let it ferment, you have yogurts. In this case, the microorganisms come from the mature yogurts, and milk has lactose in it, which is a naturally occurring sugar. This process is known as back slopping, because we're taking some mature yogurt and slopping it back into some immature milk. In terms of kombucha, we start off with tea, sweeten it, add some microorganisms, and then let it ferment in a warm place until it's ready. We'll start by making some tea. I'm gonna bring two cups of water to boil in a small saucepan over high heat. Now, we found during testing that it's important to have good quality water. Now, tap water can be heavily chlorinated, which will impede fermentation. I tested batches of kombucha using tap water, filtered water, distilled water, and spring water, and they all worked. However, we didn't really like the flavor of the distilled water because it had much less flavor, Turns out the lack of minerals does impact the flavor of the finished kombucha. But I settled on spring water because I knew it would be consistently clean and had those minerals which improved the flavor. So off heat, add four tea bags of black tea and let it steep for five minutes. Now you can also use green or white tea, but you should avoid Earl Grey. Now Earl Grey has bergamot oil in it and that's an antibacterial, so that will impede fermentation too. Unlike milk or grape juice, tea doesn't have any naturally occurring sugar in it. So we need to whisk some in. So we've got a half cup of sugar here. Now this looks like a lot, but most of it's gonna be consumed during the fermentation process. Now this amount of sugar makes a robust and reliable kombucha. If you want it a little milder, you can reduce it to six tablespoons. During testing, I tried less than that and it didn't really work. So six tablespoons really is the minimum. This one gallon jar has got six cups of water in it and this is gonna be our fermentation vessel. We're gonna transfer our tea to the jar. And I basically made a really strong tea concentrate and then we watered it down and cooled it down so that we can bring it below 100 degrees. Otherwise, it could kill the microbes in the kombucha. During testing, we found that you want a jar that will expose the kombucha to a lot of air because the bacteria needs air to do its work. To kickstart the fermentation process, I'm gonna stir in three quarters of a cup of mature kombucha. And this is kombucha that's already been fermented. Now I'm gonna add this jellyish looking thing called the pellicle. Now combined, the mature kombucha and the pellicle form the SCOBY. Now SCOBY stands for the symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. People think that the pellicle is the SCOBY. It's not. In fact, you don't even need a pellicle because a new pellicle will form with every new fermentation. During testing, we found it useful to add an existing pellicle because it sped up fermentation by a couple of days but it's optional. You only really need the mature kombucha. Now, if you're just starting off, you need to buy a SCOBY. I got this one online, or you could also get one from a friend. So what came first, the kombucha or the SCOBY? How can you get the SCOBY if you need to get it from kombucha? Kombucha had to come from somewhere. Well, it's believed that someone made some sweet tea thousands of years ago, left it out, and then through some miracle of nature, the right combination of microbes settled on it, made something that was much like kombucha, Someone then had to drink it, like it, and decide it was worth making again. 
And that's how we think the first kombucha was made, but we don't really know. And that's the same thing with mead, with wine, with yogurt, with bread. None of these foods exist in the natural world. They're all just happy accidents. Now in the SCOBY, there are various types of yeast and they will consume the sugar in the sweet tea and produce alcohol, carbon dioxide, and various flavor compounds. Other microorganisms in the SCOBY include acetic acid bacteria, and they will consume that alcohol and produce different types of acid. In this jar, we've orchestrated this beautiful, highly functional marriage of microbes. So now is a great time to taste it to give you some sort of baseline. Like warm, syrupy snapple. It's gonna taste a whole lot different in a few days' time. Now we cover it with a large coffee filter and a rubber band. And we're gonna let this ferment for six to 14 days in a warm place. During testing, we found it was important to prevent dust and fruit flies from getting into your brew. Now, a lot of people use cheesecloth to cover their kombucha, but we found during testing that fruit flies could actually burrow their way through into it and get into your kombucha, which you really wanna avoid. So something with a finer mesh, like a coffee filter or a clean t-shirt, really does the job at keeping your kombucha free from invaders. You want to avoid plastic wrap because our bacteria still needs access to air. Hygiene is important, but you don't need to be obsessive about it. Wash your hands and make sure your equipment is clean. The best way to ensure this is to run it through the dishwasher on its hottest setting. Now we're gonna put this in a warm location and let it ferment for six to 14 days. At home, I like to put mine in my basement next to my boiler, but it's different for everyone. You just want a warm place. Now we wait. I'm gonna put this in a cupboard above an oven. On day four, you should start tasting your kombucha every day to see how its flavor is developing. It's done when the sweetness of the drink is balanced by its acidity. So it's starting to change from that sweet tea on day zero to something so much more complex. Once you get into the swing of things, it'll become very easy to gauge when your kombucha is ready, but at the start, it can be tricky. Sometimes beginners can create weak kombucha, which means it's not acidic enough, and that lack of acidity can cause mold in the next batch. To help first timers, I created a kombucha calibrator. Whisk together one cup of water, four teaspoons of apple cider vinegar, and one and a half teaspoons of table sugar. It won't taste nearly as good as the kombucha, but it'll give you a good idea of the sweet and sour balance you're looking for. Checking this balance is about more than taste. It's about making sure that your kombucha is safe enough to use in a SCOBY in the future. If you really want a guarantee, you can use inexpensive pH strips that you can buy online just make sure that the pH of your starting kombucha is below 4.0. If it's not, you can add a little bit of distilled white vinegar or mature store-bought unflavored kombucha so that it's below 4.0 and that's safe level. Fermentation is fundamentally unpredictable. So for consistently good results, you want to control as many of the variables as you can. Here, I have some properly fermented finished kombucha. I call her the queen. She's absolutely stunning. Look at all these strands of yeast that are coming down here. You can see these air bubbles, so you know that there's been really healthy fermentation action. So it's actually levitated the pedicle above. And because it's sealed in a little bit of this air, it'll already be naturally mildly effervescent. So at this point, you can bottle it and refrigerate it for up to a month. Or you can make it properly fizzy by adding a tablespoon of simple syrup and letting it ferment at room temperature for another week. The yeast will consume that sugar and produce more carbon dioxide. This time, the carbon dioxide has nowhere to go. So the pressure builds in the bottle and it gets dissolved into the kombucha, which makes it fizzy. This is the exact same process used for champagne. Thanks, Joe. During my testing, when I uncovered my finished kombucha and bottled it, I ran into some hurdles. Here's what I learned. First, temperature was a massive factor in the success of our kombucha, much more so than the type of water or quantities of sugar or tea. At the end of testing, I was pretty satisfied with my results, but I decided to take things a step further and do some user testing. I gave identical kombucha kits to 10 different ATK employees, chefs, photographers, writers of all different skill levels to take home to make their own kombucha. Each home tester got a one gallon bottle of spring water, coffee filters, a one gallon mason jar, elastic bands and glass bottles, sugar, simple syrup, eight tea bags, and a SCOBY from a reputable online purveyor. And we got differing results. Some were too sweet, some were not fizzy at all, and some of our best chefs made some of the worst kombucha. And some people with no culinary experience at all made exceptional kombucha, but everyone made passable kombucha. 
we asked the people who did not do so well to take the temperature of their fermentation environment. And universally, they were all fermenting in temperatures that were too cold. This led us to establish a fermentation range of 73 to 83 degrees. Now, you do not have to go this far, but I actually created my own fermentation chamber that guaranteed the same temperature every time. And this was the best way to get consistent results. Using a large insulated container, at a seedling mat with a thermostat. They cost about 30 bucks, and you've got the same warm environment every time. Next, when bottling your kombucha, you need the right bottles. This is an important one. We need to trap carbon dioxide at high pressure in our bottles so that it can be absorbed into the kombucha. During testing, we found if you use wheat bottles, and square bottles are the worst for this, you risk the bottle shattering during the second fermentation. The best bet is one of these heavy-duty German beer-style flip-top bottles, but you can also use repurposed store-bought kombucha bottles. You also want to wipe down the mouths of the bottles to make sure you get a really good seal. And during testing, we found that these gaskets are designed to fail before the glass will break, so it means you're going to get leakages before you get explosions. When it came to making kombucha fizzy, four out of the 10 people I sent home with kits didn't really achieve that ideal fizzy kombucha. The results were inconsistent, so we had to look for another solution. So I dug a little deeper and found the best method for making it fizzy. Developing a process for foolproof fizzy kombucha definitely came with its own challenges. We tried using fruit syrups and fruit jams, and they worked okay. So then we tried some blender fruit purees, let them ferment for a week, and these were the results. There was too much microbial action, which caused an excess of carbon dioxide to be released, which the kombucha could not absorb. As the bottles opened and the pressure normalized, they erupted. It turns out that fruit pulp is much better at creating fizz for two reasons. A, there are natural yeasts already on the fruit, which contributes to the microbial action in the bottle. And B, the sugar in fruit is fructose, and that's easier for the yeast to break down than regular sugar, which is sucrose. So we knew that fruit pulp was great for that fizz, but to avoid those explosions, we knew we had to dial back the fermentation time to five days before chilling, before gently opening to release that pressure. Let's make some sparkling spicy pineapple kombucha. I'm gonna add eight ounces of thawed pineapple, one tablespoon of a Fresno pepper that I've minced and removes its seeds, and then we're gonna process this for one minute. So I'm gonna strain this into a bowl, and I'm gonna push this through so we have a nice smooth puree. So really what I'm trying to do is get rid of the solid particles here, because we don't want any of the pepper skins or the long strands of the pineapple to interfere with the texture of the drink. We wipe the bottom of the strainer, make sure we get every little bit, and we're gonna add a quarter cup of this puree to some of our kombucha. Then we wipe the bottle so it doesn't mess with the seal. Then you cap it, give it a turn so the pineapple juice is evenly incorporated and then we'll put it back in that same warm place where we fermented the first batch of kombucha for another five days. So this is our finished, fizzy, spicy pineapple kombucha. Let's pop the bottle and have a taste. No explosions, perfect. That looks fizzy. That's so good. The first thing you get is that sweet pineapple, then you get hit with a little bit of that red chili flavor, and then you get the heat. And then finally you get that little bit of a tang. So it's like this whole sequence of flavors that just come at you one after the other. And you have made this, like you've made this drink for a fraction of what it would cost at the store. I really hope that you make this kombucha at home. It's customizable, the science is so cool, and it's so satisfying to make your own fizzy drinks. Do you think you'll try making kombucha at home? Or maybe you've already made some? If so, let me know in the comments below. Be sure to like this video, hit the subscribe button, and check out americastestkitchen.com for my kombucha recipes and much, much more.